Uh, we've been uh, looking at Samuel. I've been taking you through a couple of key passages in Samuel. And today we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 16. So if you've got that in your Bibles, it will be good for you to follow with us. Let's pray. Father, as we bow before your word, as uh, we think on the depth of its truth, we are helpless without you at work in our hearts, giving us understanding, giving us the insight, and also giving us the right response to your word. And will you do that again today as we are bowed before you? Will you show us your King? That we may bow the knee to Him. That we may live our lives for Him, who gave His life for us. And we see our King, we pray. In Jesus' great name. Amen. To tell you about a minister that I knew some time back, we worked in the same circles. Quite impressive chap. He really was quite dynamic, funny, and uh, attractive. If a man can say that, and uh, had a very popular following in his church. Uh, and I must admit to you, sometimes confessing to the Lord a little bit of envy uh, at how well he was doing. But uh, a couple of years later, uh, his sin found him out as uh, uh, an immoral and an illegal lifestyle was exposed. Um, and the church was des des devastated and decimated as it emptied. And I remember being quite shaken at the time, I'm still a young minister, and uh, saying, Lord, what are you doing here? Why? Why is this happening? And being quite um, discouraged at the time and thinking, you know, Lord, why do you allow this uh, to happen in your church? Um, and for a while I was kind of in a cloud as to why God would allow a person to get into such a position and continue with such wickedness and disobedience. Now, it's in just such a hole in Israel's history that chapter 16 begins. Uh, chapter, 16 end, uh, chapter 15 ends. Uh, uh, the episode of Saul, the king that the nation the, the king like the nations that the Israelites wanted, as we saw in chapter 8 last week. Failing miserably. Um, and Samuel is the one who has to fire him. Uh, and the chapter 15 ends quite sadly with Samuel mourning the Lord himself being said to be grieving. Not that he is grieving uh, emotionally, but there is that uh, grief <coughs> that's expressed in a, in a human way in our understanding uh, of God's heart for his people. And so chapter 16 begins um, with this sad, this deflated uh, Israel, a little bit insecure as well. Things have gone wrong. There's a bit of fear, even with Samuel uh, and his, his hard line now, causing fear uh, amongst the people, as you see there when he goes to Jesse's town. Um, but uh, even Samuel himself is in a bit of a depression here because of the failure uh, of King Saul. Uh, and that same feeling that I identify with, and perhaps sometimes in your life you have felt that too. Lord, what are you doing here? This doesn't seem to be part of your plan. Why are you allowing your church to be in such a mess? Why are you allowing people in leadership to do wicked things and immoral things? And God's plans we see again and again are not our plans. And even in the midst of great disappointment and 
despair, the God of heaven and earth has his perfect plans for his people in this world. Just two things I want you to take home this morning. I want you to see this contrast between God's plans and our plans. This, the chapter begins. There's a rebuke to depressed Samuel. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Chapter 16, verse 1. How long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him from being king over Israel. Now go. There's a plan here. Fill your oil, fill, fill your horn with oil, anointing oil to anoint a king. And I'll send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Stop sitting around and feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, you may think that I don't know what I'm doing. There is a plan here in all of this. And there was a plan even with Saul that Israel had to learn the consequences of choosing a king like the other nations. And now Israel was going to learn what it was like to live under a king of God's choosing. Uh, there's a, there's a, a significant contrast between uh, chapter 8 that we saw last week um, and chapter 16 that we're looking at today. Uh, a, a contrast between who has the primacy here. God gives the people what they want in chapter 8. Make them a king. A king like the other nations. A king that they want. A popular king. A celebrity king. Whereas here chapter 16 begins with God making the king. Chapter 16 verse 1. I have provided for myself a king. There's going to be a complete different approach here. The way the world wanted things in chapter 18 and the way God wants things in chapter 16. God's going to provide for himself a king. There's the primacy and therein lies all the difference. After Saul has been anointed as king in chapter 18, it didn't last long before he failed in chapter 13. How did he fail? He didn't fail by looking impressive. He didn't fail by being mighty. He won battles. He didn't fail uh, by, by being short of any physical power or stature. He failed ultimately because he did not obey the Lord. 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 13, he gets rebuked by Samuel. You've done a foolish thing, Samuel said to Saul. You've not kept the command of the Lord your God. You've not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. Samuel's uh, Samuel picks on Saul's disobedience to God's word as the reason for his uh, removal as kingship. One of the things to realize here is that ability always comes second to obedience in God's church. The greatest and most gifted person can be very impressive up front, can impress outwardly or in all in all the world's ways, but yet without obedience to God's word, they are useless. And Samuel rebukes Saul for his disobedience. Uh, in, uh, just in the chapter before is that famous line to King Saul to obey is better than sacrifice to obey is better than sacrifice um, obedience to God's word counts more than religious practice and that's what Samuel calls Saul out for his disobedience not his strength, not his abilities, not his good looks not his height, not his impressive war record, all of those things are there But his disobedience to God's word is what matters. God is not impressed by church attendance. Did you realize that? He's not impressed by church attendance. Did you know that the devil attends church every Sunday? He's more regular than all of us. God's not impressed by church attendance. God's impressed by what you do with what you hear in church. Is your life marked by willing obedience to God's word? Or are you just part of the weekend religion crowd? And the obedience that Paul, uh, that Saul is called to show is the obedience that costs. He had to wait on God's timing. He had to wait on God to send Samuel. But he didn't. He was too impatient. He wanted to achieve what he wanted now. And he went ahead and took matters into his own hand. And suffered the consequences for it. Because he didn't want to be uncomfortable. He didn't want to look bad. He didn't want to be the loser in the people's eyes. In 
and he wasn't prepared to pay the price of obedience. Oh, this is an, an interesting self-examination question when we talk about obedience. We all profess to follow Jesus. But have you obeyed when it's really going to cost you? Or do you just obey when it's convenient for you? And that's a question only you and your heart can answer. But one of the signs of a truly born again heart is when you know you have done things to obey Jesus that have cost you and you've still done them, that have penalized you and you've still done them. There's lots of people who are happy to be a Christian as long as it's comfortable for them. But when it costs, will you still obey? When it could cost you your job, when it could cost you a relationship with a non-Christian, when it could cost you your friends, will you still obey? King Saul wasn't prepared to pay that price. He would ignore God's word when it suited him better. And so King Saul is exposed and he fails and he is, and he, he is removed. And those words to Samuel in, uh, from Samuel to Saul in chapter 13 again are famous. Chapter 13 verse 14, but your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler or prince of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commandment. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. That's often confused in our understanding. Um, it's used a couple of times in the New Testament when uh, Paul preaches about this. He says in Acts chapter 13, And God said, I found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. That phrase in the Hebrew understanding is a, is a phrase referring to a choice. Um, a priority. Uh, but there's a primacy here to the priority. It is God's heart first. Not the king he chooses. People often say David is the man after God's own heart. But it's, it's God's heart first, then David's heart. God chooses David before David chooses God. And that's all through this chapter. Chapter 16, verse 1. Um, I will send you to Jesse. I have provided for myself a king. Verse 3. I will show you what to do. You shall anoint for me him who I declare to you. It's God who takes the initiative here. God seeks out his king. God chooses the king with a heart for him. But it's God first and then David's heart that follows. And Samuel does go to Bethlehem, verse 4. And assembles the choices. Just by the way, notice there in verse 4. Why is Samuel commended as being the greatest of all judges over Israel? Because verse 4, he did what the Lord commanded. Samuel obeyed the Lord. That was his greatness. That he did what the Lord commanded. He understood that obedience is better than sacrifice. So Samuel goes to Bethlehem. In the unfolding of God's plan, different to our plan. And secondly, sees that God's ways are different to our ways. Samuel goes to the small town of Bethlehem, one of the Judean towns, and he calls for Jesse's sons. And they are presented one by one before him, from the oldest to the youngest, as the custom would be. And still is. We still would work this way, tallest to shortest, oldest to youngest, however. And immediately, Samuel sees the oldest son, and he thinks, well, this is an impressive specimen. This is the guy, verse 6. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. The Lord's anointed is Hebrew Messiah, the Messiah. That's what it means, anointed one. This must be God's king. Logically, that would be the right thing. The oldest, 
I want a son that's normally the one you choose. He looks amazing. This must be the one. But of course, even Samuel can fall into the trap of judging by outward appearances, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And that's one of the most significant verses in the Bible. It really is a commentary on every historical episode in the Bible. And how again and again, people are impressed by the outward signs, but God sees the heart. You know, we cannot actually judge other than by what we see. Because we can't see each other's hearts. I don't know what's in your heart right now. I don't know what you're harboring. I don't know what sin you're hiding. I don't know the reality of whether or not you're a Christian or not. I don't know if you're born again or not. Because I can't see if you've got an old hard heart or a new heart. I can't see those things. You know, maybe if we had those old disco lights from the 70s. Remember those disco lights from the 70s? You, know, you, you turn off all the other lights and those disco lights turn on and then your stamps kind of glows in the dark or whatever those. Um, one of you may remember those days. I don't know if they still have those. You know, maybe if we have one of those special spiritual lights that you shine and then we switch up all the lights and oh, the morning and people go in the dark. <laughs> Wouldn't that be so easy? Wouldn't that be great if we could just do that? And we could see. But of course we can't. We can't see each other's hearts. We've only got the outward appearances to go on. But God sees your heart as clearly as we can see each other right now. <coughs> And Samuel knows the heart of who he's going to choose. Uh, 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 God knows the heart of who he's going to choose. And Samuel goes through all of these seven sounds, and God rejects all of the possibilities that seemed to fit what Samuel was looking for. He looked at all of them, and this must be, maybe this one, oh, this one doesn't look too bad. No, 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 says the Lord. All of them. It's very interesting, Samuel says in verse 11 there to Jesse, Are all your sons here? Isn't that interesting? When things don't work out the way you expect, what do you do? Do you think God's made a mistake? Or do you think people have made a mistake? See, Samuel doesn't doubt God's word, even when the evidence doesn't seem to support what he has said. He immediately doubts Jesse. Did you really bring all your sons here? Not, Lord, what were you thinking? Obviously it's not in Bethlehem. You've made a mistake here. Let's go to Jerusalem. Listen, say that. Jesse, have you made a mistake here? Have you made a mistake here? Are all your sons here? And Jesse said, well, there's the youngest, or literally actually the Hebrew could be the smallest. But hey, he's looking after the sheep. Uh, you know, when you call for all my sons, we didn't even think about him. He, he, he doesn't count. He's just a boy. So he, I mean, he's obviously not factored into this thing here. He can stay look after the sheep. The candidates will come to Bethlehem. He can stay on the farm. I mean, when you call for my sons, I didn't expect him to be part of the selection process. He doesn't even appear when Jesus says, here are all my sons. <laughs> Talk about rejection issues for the others. And Samuel says to Jesse, go get him. We're not going to sit down until he comes. In other words, we're not going to have our banquet. We're not going to eat uh, until he gets here. Verse 12, and he sent and he brought him. And now he was ready and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Which tells us that just because God doesn't choose according to outside appearance doesn't mean he has to choose ugly people. <laughs> It's just that those things don't matter one way or the other. We just observe those things. And by the way, this, this kind of language is really referring to his, his, his a good looking young boy features. He, he's fresh faced. That's the, the picture here. He's not a big warrior. Um, 
He's a young, good-looking, fresh-faced young man. And then, surprise, surprise, the Lord said, Arise, anoint him. But this is he. And then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose and went on to run them. Did you notice that only at the very end of the story, the very last verse of the story, the boy is named. His name hasn't appeared in the Bible until this very verse. It doesn't appear at all. This is the first time King David's name is mentioned. And it's right at the end of the story. And immediately King David's name is mentioned in the same verse where he is anointed and the Spirit of God comes upon him. The name of Israel's greatest king comes at the end of the story. Why? Because the king is right there at the beginning. God is the king. And he calls the king that he provides for us. And that king on earth is revealed as David. And he will ultimately be the king who expresses God's kingship in its fullness through the son of David, who is Jesus. It is the primacy of God here who establishes his king. That's why almost before, almost as the story is finished, we see it's David. You see how different God's ways are in this whole event. God chooses a king from the, one of the smallest of Judah's towns, Bethlehem, from a most unexpected family in the tribe of Judah, Jesse's family. We know from the book of Ruth that Jesse is the grandson of Ruth. Ruth the Gentile, Moabite. And he chooses the youngest of this mud blood sons. David. This boy who was so young and so small that he wasn't even considered to be in the running. And they left him with the sheep in the fields. Beyond society's expectation, beyond this tribe's expectation, beyond this family's expectation, this shepherd boy turns out to be God's chosen and anointed king. Anointed by oil and the Holy Spirit. And a thousand years later, from that same small town in Bethlehem, from a Judean family of questionable origins and scandalous pregnancy, is born a son to a family so insignificant of standing in that clan that the only place they can stay is in a stable. And a baby's birth so insignificant that no one paid attention. Except heaven. And angels could not keep quiet, though the Lord stayed silent. And it's that son of David, that king of God's kingdom, who continues to be overlooked and ignored today because he doesn't fit the plans of the world or the ways that we work. He does not fit what people want in this world. He does not have the outwardly impressive credentials. He does not have the celebrity status that people flock to. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, as we read in our New Testament reading, Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly or foolishness to the Gentiles. What did the Jewish people of that first century day want? They wanted a spectacular Messiah. 
They wanted the Messiah who was going to shake the world with his arrival. But still the expectation. They wanted the Messiah of their own understanding, not of the Scripture's understanding. They didn't want a Messiah who was humiliated before their fellow Jews and executed by the oppressive Gentile Romans on a criminal's cross. That can't be our Messiah. That can't be our King. This can't be the Son of David. They can't accept that. That was the stumbling block to the Jews of that time and still is a stumbling block to this day even amongst my own Jewish family. We can't accept that Israel's Messiah is crucified on a criminal's cross by Roman oppressors. And the Greeks or the Gentiles of that day weren't interested either. They were hooked on wisdom or sophistry. That was the fashion of the day. That was what was popular of the day. They didn't have the internet and DSTV and YouTube and stuff like that. They had to get clever speakers to come to the local town hall and give impressive talks and entertain people with clever words and smart sayings and wittiness. And people would go, oh, he's so clever, I'm such a popular, I'm going to get his autograph. <laughs> Those were the celebrities of the day. Sophists. Wise, wise men. They would come traveling from town to town, impressing people with clever talk. That's what they wanted. That was celebrity of the day. Don't come and tell us about a king who is executed as a criminal on a cross. How disturbing, how tasteless, how unfashionable, how unacceptable. The Gentiles of that world would not accept something so embarrassing and foolish. And the Jews of that world would not accept something so degrading for their Messiah. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The things that the world thinks are foolish, following a failed, executed king, turns out to be God's magnificent, saving wisdom for us. And the things that the world sees as a failure, the death of a criminal on a cross, on this shameful instrument of execution, turns out to be the victorious, saving power of God for sinners like us. The cross of shame in the world's eyes is the cross of victory in our eyes. The foolishness and the embarrassment of the cross in the world's eyes is what we celebrate and proclaim to the world. We preach Christ crucified. Because it's there that your salvation lies. It's unexpected to the world. It's not our way. We wouldn't do it this way. If we had to write the Bible, I can assure you, it wouldn't have turned out like this. We would have driven, we would have written a very different story and made ourselves look better. But this is the plan of salvation. And this is the way God works. At that moment where it looks like the worst thing possible that could ever have happened is the moment of God's greatest victory. God's King dead on a cross. For you. Jesus does this for you. Your failure, your deceitful heart, your sinful secrets, your terrible, immoral desires of the heart that would send you to hell. Jesus takes that hell of God's judgment for you. And so that you and I can stand at the feet of that shameful cross and go, that's my shame there. That's my sin there. That the King takes for me. This very core of our gospel, this cross of shame, is our boast. It's our boast in our preaching, it's our boast in communion, it's our boast in baptism. It is the cross of shame. 
that is our glory. And you trust him, this king that the world overlooks and loves it and rubbishes. Do you see him that the world does not see? This king on the cross for your sake. Let's bow our heads together. Let's come before him. <coughs> Remember the words of Scripture. He was despised and rejected by me. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him is the punishment that brings us peace. And by his wounds we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each to their own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us. Do you see your sin there? You brought to your knees before that cross that the King of Heaven would consider you and love you and take your sin upon himself at that moment of greatest humiliation and shame and rejection. Your sin is there. Oh, have you bound the knee to that king? Oh, have you cried out to him, Jesus? Have mercy on me, the sinner. And will you follow him as your king? Oh Lord, forgive us for so easily looking to all of the impressive celebrity status things of this world. And taking our eyes off the cross. Make us a people of the cross. Make us proclaimers of the cross. And give us the obedience that flows 